This is the BME 271 lecture on thermography and light sensors. So let's first talk about uh, some motivation for, for discussing thermography. So all of the temperature sensors that we have so far talked about have required direct contact with tissue. And this is because what they actually measure is the temperature of the sensor itself. Rather than the, the temperature of the tissue. So heat has to be transferred, in order to make a measurement, heat has to be transferred from the tissue to the sensor. Okay, now there are two drawbacks for this. One is that it can be a slow process, meaning that uh, we can, which is embodied by the fact that we have a, a relatively large uh, time constant tau with which uh, the with which the heat uh, transfers from the tissue into the sensor. The other potential issue is that you have the potential for unsanitary conditions. So it's potentially unsanitary to have to bring a, 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 a sensor directly into contact with tissue. And it's also then uh, potentially invasive if you need to get an, a more internal measurement. And so in, and in addition to that, uh, patient compliance can be an issue. So as an alternative, thermography is a method for making images of temperature that are based on the emitted radiation, and specifically emitted radiation in the infrared range. So a hot object will em emit infrared radiation, and instead of putting something into contact with that tissue, we instead um, we instead actually uh, rely on the fact that it's emitting uh, radi photons that we can have a detector sitting off from the tissue uh, to detect. Okay, so as we said, hot sources emit heat as infrared radiation. And the amount of infrared power emitted from a hot surface per unit area per unit wavelength is given by Planck's law. Which I will write here below. So Planck's law says that the infrared power which is measured, uh, which is called W sub lambda uh, of T, so it's a function of both the wavelength and the temperature, is equal to the emissivity, that's this epsilon term, which is also wavelength dependent in general, times a constant C1, which is given below, divided by the wavelength raised to the fifth power times e to the this constant C2, which is also given below, divided by lambda, the wavelength, times T, the temperature in Kelvin, minus 1. So this is Planck's law, and it tells you how much, it tells you about the power density, essentially, uh, per unit wavelength. So I've given all the parameters here below, these fixed uh, constants, C1 and C2. T, again, is the temperature in Kelvin, and epsilon is what's called the emissivity. And it happens, it's very convenient fact, that emissivity is about 1 for skin, regardless of the wavelength. And we can use Planck's law to make an image of temperature by measuring the magnitude, sorry, the magnitude of the emitted radiation from each location or pixel in a thermography image. which is a measurement directly then of W sub lambda of T and use the W sub lambda of T equation to get the temperature back. So with these measurements there's, there are at least two ways to do this. One of them is to measure W sub lambda over a large lambda range and then find the lambda 
at which W sub lambda is maximized, and then we can use this fixed relationship that the temperature is equal to 2898 divided by the lambda at which the W sub lambda of T maximum occurs. So again, this is the lambda at the peak W sub lambda. And so uh, if you measure W sub lambda over this large lambda range, you're going to get a measurement that's going to look something like this. We'll show it on the next page. It's going to look something like this as a function of lambda. And so what you do is you figure out, once you made that measurement, then you see, well, where on this curve is the peak lambda? So that would be right about here, and that gives you the lambda sub m. Okay? Uh, the other approach is to fix the lambda of your measurement, fix the wavelength of your measurement. Uh, in other words, measure W sub lambda only at one wavelength, and then invert W sub lambda to get the temperature back. This turns out to have somewhat limited range, as we'll see on the next slide, because W sub lambda is not monotonic. Let's see, in temperature, it's not monotonic. And so it's possible that you will uh, that you can be on that you can uh, get the same value of lambda at two different temperatures, or the same value of W sub lambda at two different temperatures. But it does involve simpler hardware since you only have to make one uh, measurement at one wavelength. So here's an illustration of the W sub uh, the W sub lambda of t function, or the W sub t of lambda function. So here we're plotting this function. Uh, as a, we're plotting this function as a function primarily of wavelength for a fixed temperature. So we've got it plotted, uh, we've got W plotted uh, across a range of wavelengths at, at four different temperatures. 80 degrees, here is the lowest curve, 105 degrees, 150 degrees, and 300 degrees Fahrenheit uh, as the highest curve. And you can see that, that essentially it humps and then it goes back down. Now, uh, what we would do in, if with the first measurement approach is that, again, we would measure this function across, the, the set, across a large set of wavelengths, and then we would find the, the point at which it peaks, and then we say that that is lambda sub m, right? So if you had a true temperature of 300 degrees, then this would be your lambda sub m, right? That would occur right there, and you would look that up, and that would be about maybe 7.5 uh, microns. And then you would use that uh, T equals 2898 over lambda sub M relationship to get the true temperature. Okay? Uh, on the other hand, now the second approach then, of course, is to just fix your, fix your uh, wavelength. So that's what I've plotted on the right-hand side, is the W sub lambda of T, where I've fixed lambda, the wavelength, and then plotting the function as a function of time, or sorry, as a function of temperature. And so I, here I've got degrees Fahrenheit on the x-axis, and I've, I've restricted the axis somewhat between 90 and 110 degrees. And over this range, uh, the infrared power, W sub lambda, is, is, is a relatively, con or relatively linear function of the temperature. Uh, and so we can use this relationship uh, to, get, to get back what the, uh, what the temperature was uh, from, from this relationship. Uh, but of course, if we go far outside this range, it's possible that the that the temperature uh, it's possible to get uh, the the for this curve to go back down again. So that's because you can have for one temperature, as you see from the left hand side, for uh, if you might have a spectrum that looks like this, whereas for another curve you have a spectrum for a completely different temperature that's very far away from that temperature you have a curve like that, right? And so you can get the same. You can, it, as you can see here, you can get the same W sub lambda of T for two different, uh, for two very different temperatures, and so it's not. Uh, you have to restrict the range you're looking at in order to get a unique solution, given a certain measurement at one wavelength. Okay, so what is thermography good for? What has it actually been used for in practice? One is for as a non-invasive thermometer. Uh, so essentially that would be like a one pixel image, right? You'd have a single sensor, a single infrared sensor, 
and uh, and then use it to use that one point as a in, in non-invasive thermometer where you just essentially bring it close to the tissue, but you don't have to directly touch it. Uh, and then maybe you put a cone around it so that uh, all the all the infrared energy is only coming from the tissue itself. Uh, another application that that has been looked at fairly extensively, but actually isn't really used in practice. There's a lot of excitement about it, but it has not panned out really. Was detection of breast cancer? It's actually a pretty it was a very controversial thing. The idea being that the idea being that uh, during angiogenesis you have temperature rises, right? So, so you'd have um, is the in the idea would be that um, would be that you would leverage the uh, feature of thermographies that it, it can get very good temporal resolution to detect small changes in temperature that would be due to increased vascularization uh, in tumors. Uh, even in deep tumors, uh, but it turns out that scatter is a, is a big problem with that. Um, mammograms also uh, still detect tumors earlier since they see them prior to angiogenesis, uh, which is the, uh, the point at which the tumor becomes malignant after all. So you really want to uh, detect the tumor before it becomes uh, malignant, and so then before the angiogenesis occurs, and then therefore before you can actually detect it with thermography. So the FDA uh, does not actually approve uh, uh, thermography for breast cancer screening, even though you can. Uh, I think that there are some clinics that, that offer it. Um, this, uh, what I'm showing here, is a an image uh, from a FLIR device, right, showing a snake wrapped around, coiled around somebody's hand. You can see, obviously, that the, the hand is quite warm, you know, around 32 degrees, uh, approaching uh, body temperature, and the snake, of course, is much colder. Um, one other application that we use uh, these devices for in MR is to, is to image distribution of heat in phantoms when we're trying to figure out whether a new RF coil uh, or a new hardware design inside the bore will cause RF heating uh, in tissue. So you can build a, a body mimicking phantom uh, with similar electrical properties to, to the tissue at those RF frequencies at which the scanner operates. And then you can use uh, a FLIR camera or something like this that is essentially, f you know, that is uh, implementing thermography to detect whether or not you are heating that, uh, heating that uh, phantom up uh, beyond safe, uh, safe levels. So let's move on to light sensors now. So first we'll introduce uh, a metric by which we often compare light sensors, which is called uh, detectivity. And that is uh, this D star parameter. D star, let me find an asterisk here. So it's called detectivity, D star. Uh, it's also known as specific detectivity. Okay, and it's given by this equation. D star is equal to square root of A times delta F divided by NEP. So there are three variables in here. The first is A, and that is the area of the detector. Delta F is the frequency bandwidth over which you're measuring the light, or one over the one over the um, is the frequency bandwidth, or one over the the uh, wavelength. Uh, and NEP is the noise equivalent power. So that is the power required to get an SNR of one for a given sensor. And so that's going to be sensor dependent, okay? So it turns out that this metric is normalized by the detector's area, even though it's multiplied by the, by the root of the area. It turns out that it's actually normalized overall, if you were to plug in all the definitions of these things. Since the number of photons per unit area decreases as distance from the source increases. So we want it, so therefore it's possible to make any detector more sensitive just by increasing its surface area, the surface area of the detector. And we can appreciate the fact that the photons per unit area decreases as distance increases by thinking about a source which I represent here as a circle that is emitting photons which I represent here as these little arrows. And depending on your distance away from 
away from um, the source, if you draw like a shell, for example, let's say we draw a shell at two different distances, let's say we draw a shell here, and then a shell further away here, the density along the area of the red shell is going to be much higher, right? The, dens the photon density is going to be higher uh, for any given unit area on the red shell than it will be on the black shell since the photons, there's finite photons and they're spreading out. Okay? So recall from earlier that hot things radiate infrared radiation. And in general, then, we can use temperature changes in thermal sensors, right? So not actual light sensors necessarily, but thermal sensors due to incident light to measure that light. So incident light on any given thermal sensor will change its temperature, and we can use that to measure the light. So the, and that's the first kind of light sensor that we're going to talk about is these thermal light sensors. And so, again, such detectors are called thermal light detectors since they are based on temperature changes in the device. Uh, due to incident light. And there are three types. One we've already talked about, which is thermopiles in the last lecture. Oops. I should say thermopiles. Uh, the second is bolometers. And these are devices whose resistance delta r the resistance changes with incident light and the third kind is pyroelectric and we'll talk more in particular about pyroelectric sensors electric So thermal light sensors dependent on uh, the pyroelectric effect is what we'll talk about next. So this effect refers to temporary voltages that are produced across a given crystal of a certain material when it's heated or cooled. And that means that currents only appear when temperature changes, when temperature of the crystal changes. So electric currents only occur on, appear on the crystal when the temperature changes, and those currents are proportional to, the, to that size of the change in temperature. Okay, So if, if, the, uh, if the currents are only appearing when temperature changes, that means that if we have a fixed constant DC light, or a fixed constant light intensity, or a, a DC light intensity, then we're going to need something that we call a chopper to be able to make a continuous measurement of it. Okay, So I'll illustrate that here. So let's say we have a light source, which I'll represent as a candle here. So that's our source. And then we have our crystal here, our sensor crystal. I'm trying to draw a crystal there, like a diamond kind of shape. So when we first turn on the source, we're going to get some voltage uh, change across the sensor crystal, but, we won't, but then it will go away and we won't be able to see any signal after that. So what we have to do is introduce a chopper. And so this is essentially like an opaque wall that we move up and down between the source and the crystal so that it's constantly changing. The, the temperature on the crystal is constantly changing. And so then we get current, current, uh, electric current arising on the crystal whenever the chopped is, chopper is pulled away or moved back so that the sensor crystal changes temperature at that point. And that is how we can make continuous measurements of the light source. And it turns out that for the other thermal light detector types, such as uh, the thermopiles and the bolometers, we also need choppers to separate signal uh, from ambient temperature, so for a slightly different region reason, not because we won't get any signal when we have, uh, not because we won't get any signal when we when we uh, when we have a constant exposure to the source, but because if we won't be able to separate it, we won't be able to essentially filter the uh, 
filter out the, the, the signal that we're getting from ambient temperature from the signal that we're getting from the source. But if we add a chopper, then if we have a chopper between the source and the detector, then the, 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 signal, uh, then the signal components corresponding to the source will have a higher frequency than the ambient temperature signal components. So you can imagine that we can use a high-pass filter to get, at the, uh, to get at the signal components due to the, to, due to the light source. So the response, uh, the advantage to these thermal light detectors in general is that their response is, is relatively independent of, of wavelength of light, right? So you can get a wide band, wide band uh, measurement. There are disadvantages, there are a couple disadvantages to them. One is that they are slow, right, because it, for, again, the same reason that, that it takes a while for, for them to heat up, right, in response to exposure to a light source. And they can also have low sensitivity. which, again, would be quantified, they would have a relatively low value of their specific detectivity. So in contrast to thermal light detectors, photon detectors are the other type, and they directly convert photons striking a material into changes in current and voltage. or into changes in conductance or resistance equivalently. And there are several types. We're going to talk only about one of them uh, here. One of, and the first major type is semiconductors, and this is certainly going to be the most, the most common uh, that you're going to find. One type of semiconductor, one is photodiodes, and we're going to talk in more detail about that in the next slides. Uh, then other types include PIN photodiodes, which work a bit differently. PN junctions. Oops. PN junctions. and transistors that you can essentially ex expose the gate of the transistor to incoming photons. And again, it's the photodiodes that we're going to talk about in detail on the subsequent slides. Other types are uh, photoconductive cells, right, like solar kind of cells, and photomultipliers. Okay, so getting into more detail into photodiodes, in photodiodes we have photons that collide with electrons in the diode. And if those photons have sufficient energy, then the result of that collision will be a, that a whole electron pair will be produced, and that pair will be swept in opposite directions across the junction by the intrinsic electric field built into the junction that we get when we bring the two materials that make up the diode together. Then we get this intrinsic electric field across the junction. It's built in, it's always there. And we get, when they're swept across that junction, of course, because they're moving, that creates a, an electric current. And it turns out that it's a reverse current compared to the conventional, uh, the convention of which way current goes in the, in the diode. Uh, and that reverse current will do two things. It, it, it will have two characteristics. One is that it will increase uh, linearly with incident radiation since each incoming photon, since the radiation is proportional to the number of photons, and, uh, and for each photon that comes in, one unit of current is produced. So it's going to be uh, linear with incident radiation. And the other thing is that it's going to be fast. Or it occurs quickly. And it turns out that the response times are on the order of maybe one microsecond. So you have, you have a current arising less than one microsecond uh, after a photon comes in and hits an electron, generating an electron pair and producing uh, a whole electron pair and producing a reverse current. And here's how we could use a photodiode in a circuit. So here I've drawn a circuit, a simple op-amp circuit, uh, 
which is, which is just a current to voltage converter, right? So we talked about this kind of a circuit recently when we talked about current to voltage converters, where the, the diode itself is actually the current source here, and we flip it upside down so that the, the, the dark so that the current due to the uh, due to the um, so that the current uh, from the, through the diode uh, is going the, the way we would like it so that we get a positive voltage out. And so then the current through the diode here, Right. Note, note again that this I sub D is, is referenced opposite the direction that you would normally uh, have current going through, it, reference current going through a diode, which would be th going from anode to cathode. We are doing the opposite, going cathode to anode. So this current has a linear dependence on the incident light given by I sub D equals I sub dark. You guys have now seen this. I sub dark plus alpha times the light power. Okay, and this term alpha is what's called the flux responsivity, and that's in units of uh, amps per milliwatt. And so then the light, of course, would be then have to be in units of milliwatts so that that cancels out, and you just get amps, which are the units of current. Uh, and the dark current here is a, is a fixed quantity that is due to other, primarily other background radiation. So in this current to voltage, uh, in this current again, in this current to voltage. Uh, converter circuit, the diode is reverse biased, just meaning that meaning that uh, the, the voltage across it is less than its turn-on voltage, which is usually around 0.7 volts. And here, in fact, uh, specifically, the voltage drop across the diode is exactly 0 volts, right, since we have it connected to, the zero, to, the, to one of the terminals of the op amp, and the other terminal is tied to ground. So then it turns out that we can now draw the, uh, the voltage current curve for the diode, and as we vary the incident light, this curve is going to move up and down. So the current is going to move up and down the V sub D equals zero vertical, where V sub D is the voltage across the, across the diode, which is fixed at zero here. So if we draw this whole curve, you guys have probably seen this before, note here that I'm now plotting minus I sub D, where I've defined I sub D as being the uh, the uh, the the current uh, by the, the current direction by the convention on as I have it drawn on the previous slide, so this is consistent with the way I've got it drawn. So a convention so with no incident light we'd have some small reverse current, uh, some small offset from from zero from the v equal v equal from the d equals zero point. We have some small offset due to the dark current, and uh, if so and that's so that's for the case with zero milliwatts. And as we increase the power, let's say arbitrarily in steps of five milliwatts, say that we have five milliwatts, then we go to ten milliwatts. We'll get these these uh, these the same step size in current across from the diode, and then maybe fifteen. So these guys are the incident light, the piece of light. Okay, so it's going to be, what we're doing in that circuit is we're fixing V, to, v sub D to zero, so we're moving up and down this vertical uh, with increasing or decreasing light. So some of the advantages of photon detectors are, again, that they are fast, as we said before, and they also have a high detectivity. which is on the order of maybe about 10 to the 12th. So it's quite high, quite high number there. The main disadvantage to them is that they are sensitive to a relatively narrow range of light wavelengths. Uh, and that's due to the selected photoconductor that that wave of that range of wavelengths that is that the, any given uh, device is sensitive to is due to the selected semiconductor band gap energy. So this is the energy required to produce that whole electron pair, right? And uh, and it turns out that that energy is uh, is a function of the energy that any given uh, any given incoming photon has is a function of its wavelength and it that energy increases with frequency 
So that's why that's why we have this uh, this uh, relatively narrow sensitivity is that it takes a certain energy to knock uh, to knock the electron uh, out and create a whole electron hole pair, and so and uh, and so that and that energy is dependent on the wavelength, uh, and that energy will also depend on on then on how the device is built. So let's say we have a given spectrum to which we are sensitive, as a function of lambda for a given for a given uh, photodiode. So this would be sort of the uh, sort of the sensitivity or the the, sp the detectivity d star of the photodiode, whereas a thermal detector is going to have a much broader a much broader detect albeit lower specific detectivity. As we said, they are pretty much lambda independent. So to finish up, let's uh, briefly go over some light sensor applications. So one of the first set of applications is the detection of frequency specific emissions, frequency or conversely wavelength specific emissions. Uh, so for example, we have infrared detection that we want to do to measure temperature non-invasively. We also have uh, applications in fluorescence. or luminescence in luminescence luminescence and then uh, then there's optical spectroscopy such as uh, near infrared spectroscopy which is a a method that is used for uh, functional brain can be used for functional brain imaging, optical functional brain imaging. Nerves. And so I've illustrated those. To, I've just pulled some images off the internet to illustrate those. So this is a, a an image of a nerve setup where we have a given uh, optical photon source that then uh, injects photons into the tissue where they scatter. Uh, and are attenuated by the by the uh, by the tissue, depending on its properties, such as uh, oxygenation of blood, and then they come back out and are sensed by detectors. They bounce back out and are sensed by detectors that are placed somewhere near the source. Uh, and then on the right here, I've got some. I've got just a fluorescence, uh, fluorescence image, an example of a fluorescence image, which is often used to to image functional aspects of cells or uh, or functional or geometric aspects of cells. Uh, and then there's remote sensing as another area of application of, of light detectors so in remote within a, with uh, within remote sensing we have uses in interrupter cells and uh, optical encoders and also in interferometry Interferometry, and we'll talk specifically more about optical encoders in the next couple of lectures. Uh, another application that that finds lots of uses in in biomedical research in biomedical work are uh, using light sensors as a as a plus light sources as a means of optical isolation or opto isolation, which uh, is used to reduce noise and uh, also common mode signals that might arise if we have if we use uh, wires to transmit uh, electrical wires to transmit signals go ahead and bring that down like that okay so for example i think i talked about this previously in the course but uh, but in, in MR now, uh, uh, all the receivers, uh, in, all the RF receivers inside the uh, inside the bores are now going to optical connections to the outside, so that they don't have to send these long transmission lines essentially uh, to transmit the signals all the way, you know, 20, 30 feet uh, to get to the to the room where they're actually digitized. Uh, so now they're using optical optical lines to do that uh, instead to reduce those no that noise. And then finally, of course, in fiber optics, uh, light sensors and light and sources are used all the time uh, in fiber optics.